It's all going excitingly wrong tonight in this hoarding world that I live in. Um, I'm going to be talking to you tonight about great hoarders in literature, but unfortunately because of my hoarding nature where I can barely see through the stacks of books which are surrounding me, which is why I've got my gloves on and my duster out so that I can try and desperately keep things clean in these teetering piles of books and I've got my spray so I can clean as I go this evening when I talk to you about hoarding. I wonder if any of you are hoarders. Many of you might be book hoarders like me and as you can see I have huge stacks of books when does collecting become hoarding? That's what I'm going to be asking you this evening. And actually, in order to be able to talk to you tonight, I am going to move these teetering piles, as otherwise we won't really be able to see each other. Um, but you can hear my books falling around me as we speak. I do have huge piles of books <laughs> that you can see and we you could say that we have been a bit of a family of hoarders in our lives. I don't know if any of my family are watching me this evening but my brothers will remember our grandparents house, our grandparents attic was full of amazing wonderful objects which you could describe as collector's items or you could describe as being a kind of hoarding. I'm just worrying about my technology this evening. It is all going a little bit weird because my printer ooh, wasn't working, which means that I've got to read my notes off a phone. Do please tell me if the sound is not brilliant. I'm going to have to take off these gloves because it's actually quite difficult to work the technology with them on. And I'm just going to try and adjust um, the way that I'm talking to you this evening because everything seems to be slightly falling apart this evening. Um, do mention if the sound isn't perfect. Boot boot. You're there on Instagram. Tell me if you can hear me okay. Give me a wave if you can hear well and give me a thumbs down if you can't hear so well. So hoarders in literature. It is a fascinating topic and I'm going to start by talking to you about what hoarding is. Oh thank you for telling me that the sound is fine. That's great to know. Um, lovely to see you and great to have you joining me, Boot Boot and also Colleen. Now I wonder if you feel, um, have strong feelings about hoarding. I certainly do because I think I'm always a bit scared that I could become a hoarder. Hi Jane. Ah, oh, hi Jane. <laughs> Great to see you. Um, do any of you have hoarding tendencies? I definitely do. You can see behind me all those books. And books alone, I think, are not a bad thing to hoard. But sometimes it can become a problem if you're hoarding um, junk newspapers, maybe um, receipts from shops. And many of the people that I'm going to be talking tonight, talking about tonight in literature, are hoarders of many, many things. And it gets out of hand to the point where they can't actually control what is in their house. And it gets to a point where their friends and relatives can't come and visit them because their house is too full of the things that they've been hoarding. So I'm just going to read to you a little bit about what the NHS, the NHS says about hoarding disorder because it's pretty fascinating. A hoarding disorder is where someone acquires an excessive number of items and shares, stores them in a chaotic manner. 
usually resulting in unmanageable amounts of clutter. The items can be of little or no monetary value. Hoarding is considered a significant problem if the amount of clutter interferes with everyday living. For example, the person is unable to use their kitchen or bathroom and cannot access rooms. The clutter might be causing significant distress or negatively affecting the quality of the life of the person or their family. For example, they become upset if someone tries to clear the, cl the clutter and their relationship suffers. Hoarding disorders are challenging to treat because many people who hoard frequently don't see it as a problem, which is very much the case in all of the fiction that I'll be talking about this evening, or they have little awareness as to how it's affecting the lives of others. Many do realise they have a problem, but they're reluctant to seek help because they feel ashamed, humiliated or guilty about it. It's really important to encourage a person who's hoarding to seek help as their difficulties in discarding objects can not only cause loneliness and mental health problems, but also pose a health and safety risk. And in many of the novels in which hoarders star, those protagonists are actually at risk to their health because they might fall down the stairs trying to avoid the teetering piles of rubbish or they might even have toxic items in their house, which they're hoarding. Um, why do people hoard, we ask ourselves? Well, it can be a symptom of another condition. It's not really understood, according to the NHS web website. It might be that they have mobility problems, so they're physically unable to clear the clutter from their house uh, that they've acquired. It might be that they have learning disabilities or that they're developing dementia and therefore they can't categorise and dispose of items. Many of us might be feeling more and more concerned about whether we are hoarders. Uh, many of you perhaps aren't, but I always feel it's quite close to the bone. While we're thinking about that, I'm just going to see if my notes are printed out. I'll be right back. It actually does look as if it's been printed out. Hooray! Which means that I can work from paper rather than a telephone. Um, so people who are hoarders, are it's often associated with self-neglect and it might be people who are more likely to live alone, be unmarried, have had a deprived childhood with either lack of material objects or a poor relationship with other members of their family. They might have a family history of hoarding. They might have grown up in a cluttered home and never learned to prioritise and sort items. And when attempting to discard things, this might bring up strong emotions, which can be extremely negative and make it very difficult for the people that are trying to help them to actually do anything particularly useful in terms of decluttering. So attempts to discard the hoarded items can go down very badly and people coming in to try and do a bit of cleaning might find that it's very difficult to actually get their rubber gloves on and get into decluttering. Um, many people actually start off perhaps as collectors and this is a question when does collecting become hoarding? Well the thing is with collectors and collections normally people collect in a more ordered fashion and they might categorise things, have lists, have method in their madness whereas hoarders tend to be more chaotic and simply have piles and piles of maybe newspaper reviews without actually being able to find anything. And many of the books you read which have hoarders in them can be incredibly stressful <laughs> because they make you see all these piles of terrible um, items that have been built up over the years and you, see, you witness some of the characters in the novels for instance, there's one 
that I'm reading right now called Le by Lisa Jewell, which is called The House We Lived In, which is all about a hoarder. And in that one, the lady who's the heroine um, is looking for the birth certificates of her children and she can't find them anywhere until she eventually finds them in a plastic bag full of brightly coloured straws, which she's been keeping for the last five years and is really excited to rediscover more of that later. But I must admit, reading about hoarders can be something that is quite stressful to anyone that feels that they might have any kind of hoarding tendencies. And I'd love to know if you feel like you might be hoarders or if you've ever feared that you might become them. And also, if you have any interesting characters that you can think of in books who are hoarders. There's quite a lot of them out there. So, intriguingly, another aspect of hoarding, which people will be familiar with in this current age, is the hoarder, hoarding of data and the hoarding of emails and, in fact, electronic photographs, which many of us are very bad at dealing with decluttering, sorting out, categorising, putting into albums, or in the case of emails, going through them and getting rid of them. Any of you guilty of that? I bet you are. I definitely am. Book hoarding is also a disorder, uh, which might come as a surprise to some of you. Some of you might actually... Oh, you're saying the sound is bad. Thank you, Jane. That is good to know. I'm going to now hold the phone up. Let me know if that's any better. Hopefully it might be. Um, I'm hoping that the muzziness that you're referring to might disappear better. Thank you. So um, book hoarding is also a disorder, also known as biblo bibliomania in which a person collects books of any kind, regardless of interest or value. The book hoarder may amass a collection that's stored in every room of his or her house, often leaving space for little else. And I'm going to give you a few famous book hoarders just before we start getting into the world of fiction. Um, I'll give you a few facts. So Carl Lagerfeld apparently has a collection of 300,000 books. George Lucas, 27,000. Jay Walker, 20,000. Michael Jackson, 10,000. Ernest Hemingway, 9,000. Um, Thomas Jefferson, 6,400. Nigella Lawson, 6,000 books. That's pretty impressive. And Naomi Alderman, another famous writer. I once had a bibliotherapy session with her because she told me about her bibliomania and she had at least 2,000 books, possibly more. The person who owns the largest number of books privately, not in a library, is John Q. Benham of Avoca, Indiana, USA, who has a private collection of over 1.5 million books. That's quite a terrifying thought. Um, I'll also just tell you about a couple of real hoarders before we get into fiction. So I think people are quite fascinated by hoarders and we know that because there's quite a lot of uh, TV programmes about hoarders which go into people's homes, show you their hoarding tendencies and then um, show people helping them to declutter, which is quite a satisfying activity. Um, Bettina Grossman is a famous real hoarder who lived in New York's famed Chelsea Hotel, uh, which is the place everyone from Mark Twain to Janis Joplin called home. And it was also home to an unknown artist by the name of Bettina Grossman. Bettina had been living in the Chelsea Hotel as one of its artists in residence for over 30 years and had amassed an entire lifetime of artwork. The fruits of Bettina's labour lay stashed away in hundreds of boxes inside her tiny two-room apartment. When filmmaker Sam Bassett, another artist in residence in the Chelsea, discovered Ms Grossman, she was literally sleeping on a deck chair in the hallway. 
Bassett became inspired by Bettina's artwork and eventually convinced her to display her various collages and mixed media portraits. He even helped build shelves to organise it all. And Bettina thus came to fame as an amazing artist. And there was a documentary about her called Bettina, which chronicles the eccentric artist's long road to personal recovery. Um, OK, so now I'm going to start talking about books about hoarders because there's a lot of amazing books about hoarders, some non-fiction, which I will start with and then we'll get on to the fictional hoarders who are the ones that I find the most fascinating. So there's a great book about the hoarding issue, which is interesting for people who are curious about it as a disorder called Stuff, Compulsive Hoarding and the Meaning of Things by Randy G. Frost and Gail Steckerty. And this is a book which asks, what possesses someone to save every scrap of paper that's ever come into his or her home? What compulsions drive a woman like Irene, whose hoarding cost her her marriage? Or Ralph, whose imagined uses for cast off items like leaky old buckets almost lost in his house? Randy Frost and Gail Seckety were the first to study hoarding when they began their work a decade ago. They expected to find a few sufferers, but ended up treating hundreds of patients and fielding thousands of calls from the families of others. Now they explore the compulsion through a series of compelling case studies in the vein of Oliver Sacks, with vivid portraits that show us the traits by which you can identify a hoarder's piles on sofas and beds that make the furniture useless, houses that can be navigated only by following small paths called goat trails, vast piles of paper that the hoarders churn but never discard, even collections of animals and garbage. That's another aspect of hoarding which is very interesting and a bit worrying, which is people that hoard animals. Frost and Steckerty illuminate the pull that possessions exert on all of us whether we're savers, collectors or compulsive cleaners, very few of us are in fact free of all the impulses that drive hoarders to the extremes in which they live. So that's Stuff by Randy Frost and Gail Steckerty, very interesting non-fiction book about hoarding. Um, then I'll just give you a few other non-fiction titles. Dirty Secret. A Daughter Comes Clean About Her Mother's Compulsive Hoarding, uh, The Secret Lives of Hoarders, True Stories of Tackling Extreme Clutter, and then moving on to a memoir, Coming Clean by Kimberly Ray Miller. This is called A Stunning Memoir about a childhood spent growing up in a family of extreme hoarders and hiding squalor behind the veneer of a perfect family. Kim Miller is an immaculately put together woman with a great career, loving boyfriend and a beautifully tidy apartment in Brooklyn. You'd never guess that she spent her childhood hiding behind the closed doors of her family's idyllic Long Island house, navigating between teetering stacks of ageing newspaper, broken computers and boxes upon boxes of unused junk festering in every room. The product of her father's painful and unending struggle with hoarding. So this is a coming of age story, which is a memoir called Coming Clean. And it is a fascinating and eye opening um, view of growing up in a hoarder's home. And also she conceals her father's shameful secret from friends for years. And she reveals the emotional burden that ultimately led to an attempt to take her own life. Now, this is a theme which comes up in lots of the fiction that we're going to talk about this evening, which also does come into the book I mentioned a few moments ago by Lisa Jewell, which is called The House We Grew Up In. And that's really interesting in terms of the emotional burden of the children living with the mother who is the hoarder, because in that novel, the mother is more and more obsessed with keeping absolutely everything, every little article of their lives, 
every picture that they ever drew, every garment that they ever wore, every reminder of a happy Easter, including the foils from the Easter eggs in all their bright colours. And the children are um, too embarrassed to bring their friends back to their mother's house because they know that their mother's house looks really bizarre, the house that they grew up in, to anyone who's coming from the outside. So that's really interesting in terms of memoir. Then I'm going to talk about a kind of memoir, which was the first book that actually made me aware of the fascination of hoarders in literature, which is a book called The Trauma Cleaner by Sarah Krasnostein, which was published in 2019. And The Trauma Cleaner is it's not exactly a memoir because it's written by a journalist about a woman called Sandra Pankhurst, who effectively is telling her life story to Sarah Krasnostein, but she doesn't write it herself. She lets Sarah, the journalist, write it. And Sandra Pankhurst is an unreliable narrator with an unreliable memory for reasons which will become clear. And this is an absolutely brilliant, fascinating book, which has really sent me down the route of hoarders in the first place. So Krasnostein first encountered Sandra, Sandra Pankhurst at a conference on forensic support services. Hoarding, homicide and meth lab cleanups were only some of the services that Pankhurst offered. Fascinating material for a book right there. And Sarah Krasnostein is a journalist who used to be a lawyer. However, um, Krasnostein got even more excited when she started talking to Sandra Pankhurst and found out more about her because uh, Sarah Krasnostein, the journalist, accompanied Pankhurst and her hazmat suited team to the horrendous jobs that they routinely tackle. So Pankhurst is the trauma cleaner of the title and she her job is to go into people's homes after a trauma, which could be a suicide, could be a murder, could be the after effects of someone that has been a hoarder for a long time. And Sandra Pankhurst's job, which she invented herself, is to go in to these scenes of trauma and deal with the possessions that have been left there. And she sees herself as a caring and compassionate person who has gone into these places in order to alleviate the suffering of the relatives of the people who are affected by the trauma of the house. And Sandra Pankhurst is indeed an amazingly compassionate and brilliant woman. But it's all the more interesting as a book because... Sandra Pankhurst was once a man. So Pankhurst is a husband, father, drag queen, sex worker and wife. The Trauma Cleaner is a love letter to an extraordinary, ordinary life. Um, Sandra Pankhurst is a woman who appears to be capable of taking a lifetime of hostility and transphobic abuse and using it to care for some of society's most in-need people. So Sandra Pankhurst founded her trauma cleaning business to help people whose emotional scars were written on their houses. From the forgotten flat of a drug addict to the infested home of a hoarder, Sandra enters properties and lives at the same time. Few of the people she looks after know anything of the complexity of Sandra's own life. Sandra was raised in an uncaring home and she has a miraculous gift of warmth and humour in the face of unspeakable personal tragedy and this is what marks her out as a one-off. Sandra Pankhurst is an incredibly inspiring woman um, and the book The Trauma Cleaner is a book I frequently prescribe to many people because it's such a uplifting, interesting, positive read 
uh, great also as an audiobook, in which we hear about the life of Sandra Pankhurst, how she grew up. She was adopted. She was adopted in a way to replace uh, the son of the couple that adopted her. But you need to read it to find out more about that. And she grew up realising she was a boy and she realised that she was truly a woman, but she didn't manage to have a sex change until her late 20s because she grew up in Australia. She's now about 70 and she grew up at a time where it was highly uncommon to have a sex change, but she did manage to do this against all odds and and against a lot of personal abuse and a lot of um, people not taking her seriously as well. She had to work as a sex worker. She worked as a as a transvestite dancer before she had her sex change. And she was always an amazingly caring person. And it's partly because when she worked as a transvestite dancer, she looked after all the other people who were in her gang. She slowly became more and more of a caring person, looking after people more and more. And that's what led her to start her business as a trauma cleaner. And that's what made her eventually encounter fascinating people who had gone through great traumas, whether it was being hoarders or having had other disasters such as uh, suicide or um, indeed murders. But the other clever thing about the book, which I love, is that one doesn't see the horror. It's only really happening backstage like a Greek tragedy. The book really focuses on the positives of Sandra Pankhurst, Pankhurst and her life and the ways that she helps people rather than the terrible things that happen off stage, so to speak. I'm going to read you a little bit from the book to give you an idea of what it's like to read, but I really recommend it. This is The Trauma Cleaner by Sandra Sandra Pankhurst. I listened to Sandra's news like it was the middle of the Han Dynasty and she'd just returned west from the Silk Road, except that she was really just telling me about her morning or her afternoon, about waiting for the psych team to collect the man who killed his dog so that she could clean its blood off his floors, about a love triangle stabbing, about the man who died in the ceiling of his home while spying on his family, about the dead hermit eaten by his dog, about the 240-litre container of syringes she filled and removed from a drug house, about the man who threw himself on a table saw and the mess he left for his family to find. I learned the many sides of Sandra, the social commentator. We've some areas where no life skills are taught. We're getting generation after generation that are slovenly. The bawdy. I've had more cock than I've had hot dinners. The confident. If I had better health, I'd run for government and I'd be a kick-ass person. The self-compassionate. I have no shame of what I've had to do to get where I needed to go. The philosophical. Everything happens for a reason and it's really hard to say why it happens at the time. The perfectionist. I've always set tough standards as a prostitute. I was a great prostitute as a cleaner. I'm a great cleaner. Whatever I do, I do to the best of my ability. And the positive. This year is going to be my best year ever. Which is all to say, I learned that Sandra is at once exactly like you or me or anyone we know. And at the same time, she is utterly peerless. One thing Sandra is not, however, is a flawlessly reliable narrator. She's in her early 60s and when it was written, and simply not old enough for that to be the reason why she's so bad with the basic sequence of her life, particularly her early life. Many facts of Sandra's past are either entirely forgotten, endlessly interchangeable, neurotically ordered, conflicting or loosely tethered to reality. She's open about the, facts that have dr the, the fact that drugs have impacted on her memory. I don't know. I can't remember. The reason, the lesson to be learnt is this. Do not take drugs. It fucks your brain. 
It's also my belief that her memory loss is trauma induced. So this is a, a brilliant book. Sandra Pankhurst also has, uh, she's a, she has to be connected to an oxygen machine because she has a lung disorder. So she is amazing. She's always so positive and manages to get through her days, which are utterly traumatizing in a way that's incredibly inspiring. And as Laughing John is mentioning, it's a great book. Do read it. I'm also going to mention briefly some other books in which hoarders have appeared in a small way, such as in Bleak House. Many of the characters in this novel suffer, sorry, by Charles Dickens, suffer from one kind of cognitive or psychological disorder or another. The novel as a whole offers some kind of a theory of disorders of accu accumulation and the writing speaks to, about that in all sorts of ways. But the scenes that describe something closest to what we would now call hoarding are those set in Crook's rag and bone shop. So even in the time of Dickens, hoarders were part of literature. In Carl Ove Nausgaard's famous book, My Struggle, Volume 1, uh, there is a bit of a hoarding theme. It's a, one of the best literary depictions of the thing that we now call hoarding and how it can destroy a lived environment. But I'm now going to talk about some more recent popular novels in which hoarding appears. So we have The Hoarder by Jess Kidd, which is a really fascinating novel for people that don't know it. Jess Kidd is a really interesting author who does take elements of reality and elements of fantasy, sometimes with ghosts, sometimes with saints. And in this book, The Hoarder, her theme is the topic which we're discussing tonight. So it's about Maud Drennan, underpaid carer and unintentional psychic, the latest in a long line of dog's bodies for the ancient belligerent Cathal Flood. Despite her best efforts, Maud is drawn into the mysteries concealed in Flood's filthy once grand home. She realises slowly that something is changing. Cathal and the junk-filled rooms slowly open up to her. So it's a really interesting, very atmospheric novel in which Kid takes us from West Ireland to West London, where care worker Maud has been tasked with looking after the bedraggled giant, Cathal Flood, the hoarder of the book's title. It's a tough, thankless job and Maud suspects that it's been given to her because, like Flood, she's Irish and therefore more likely to be able to persuade him that he needs help. Because as we were discussing earlier, one of the interesting things about hoarders is that they tend not to believe that they have a problem. Since his wife's death, Flood has gradually allowed himself to descend into squalor and Bridalmere, his sprawling grade two listed townhouse, has become overwhelmed with years of a crude jumble. From the outside, and it's an imposing, it's an imposing place of lowering grandeur, even if the garden path is lined with eviscerated mattresses and abandoned car batteries. The interior is similarly chaotic and kid readers renders all its mouldering glories with a sharp eye from the dead mouse curled in a teacup to the dismembered Barbie doll that Maud imagines as part of some sort of art installation like the abstract expressionist shit that splatters the wall and the mug tree lodged in the toilet bowl. So it's pretty grim, but in this book, we have the other common theme in which every piece of junk seems to tell a piece of history, a, piece, a story, and that's why Flood is so unable to throw anything away. And that's also a common theme in the... Um, book that I was mentioning earlier, which is called The House We Grew Up In. And in that book also, every piece of junk is actually impossible to throw away. 
In her quest for truth, Maud is accompanied by the spirits of various saints that intermittently drift in and out of the proceedings. So saints come in and out of the book in a rather wonderful way, floating around. And the, so the main character sees the dead. And that's also a conceit which we have in Jess Kidd's first novel, which was called Himself. Because in that novel, there are... Um, also ghosts who are very much part of the story. It's all deeply fascinating and brilliant. Um, I am wearing on my head, I, thanks for asking, it's actually a rather lovely headscarf, which I'm wearing because I'm trying to be a cleaner. I'm channeling um, Sarah Krasnostein's trauma cleaner, Sandra Pankhurst, because I imagine she would wear a headscarf a bit like this. Though, in that novel, something I didn't mention, sorry, it's not a novel, it's a kind of journalistic memoir. Sandra Pankhurst is always immaculate. She's always wearing white. She's always looking absolutely perfect. She has perfect nails and she always wears perfect lipstick and, of course, makeup, probably slightly differently to mine. So I'm being a mixture of Sandra Pankhurst and myself. I'm also wearing magpie earrings because magpies are meant to be hoarders. Though a study in 2014 apparently revealed that they're not hoarders, they don't love shiny things. This is a myth. And this is something I was actually talking about a couple of nights ago with Charlie Gilmore, um, because I was interviewing him about his book Featherhood at the House of St. Barnabas, doing one of my sessions, which are called Under the Covers. And that's all about this book in which Charlie adopts a magpie and the magpie um, becomes very good, very close to him and very much part of his life. To say hello to the cat there, that's Lulu um, interrupting my session. And Charlie was talking to me about the fact that um, magpies have this mythical way of behaving that they are meant to be hoarders and collectors of shiny objects but the reality is apparently they actually don't collect shiny objects um it's all a myth though in his book featherhood the um his magpie lives up to its mythical expectations and does actually um behave like a mythical magpie and collect shiny objects intriguingly anyway that's why i'm wearing the magpies partly in honor of featherhood which is a brilliant book and you should definitely read uh and it's really fascinating about the magpie and partly because i'm referring to that myth of magpies being hoarders which is actually not true so moving on to another book there's another novel which is of a lighter variety called Objects of My Affection by Jill Smolinski, which is about Lucy Bloom, broke, freshly dumped by her boyfriend, forced to sell her house to sell her 19-year-old son to drug rehab. She's lost it all, but she's determined to start over. Then when she's offered a high-paying gig helping clear the clutter from the home of reclusive and eccentric painter Marva Mayer Rios, Lucy grabs the opportunity. Armed with the organising expertise she gained while writing her book, Things Are Not People, and fuelled by a burning desire to get her life back on track, Lucy rolls up her sleeves to take on the mess that fills every room of Marva's huge home. Lucy soon learns that the real challenge may be taking on Marva, the artist, who seems to love the objects in her home too much to get to let go of any of them. So that is a really fun book about an eccentric artist who can't throw things away. All sounding a little bit close to the bone for me. But talking of not throwing things away, this is one of a collection of scarves and handkerchiefs uh, from my mum, which of course I could not throw away, and she was a bit of an inveterate collector, but very organised. I wouldn't call her a hoarder, I'd call her a collector. 
Um, so that was an interesting novel. Then we've also got a novel called Keepsake, which is by Christina Riggle. And this explores the most complicated of relationships as two sisters raised by a hoarder deal with old hurts and resentments and the very different paths their lives have taken. Riggle approaches these important topic, topics poignantly and honestly, and she is uh, looking at hoarding and obsessive compulsive disorder in this book, Keepsake. And it's a book which does come with real emotional power and compassion while looking at families dealing with hoarders. So this is a really interesting book in which the family um, is nearly torn apart by social services when a knock on the door comes from social services about to take away a mother's child. And in this novel, the mother does exactly what any mother would do. She does everything that she can to keep her child, but she is a hoarder. And so she does her absolute best to try and keep it a secret that she's a hoarder and then find ways of dealing with motherhood and boarding. So that's Keepsake um, by Riggle is the author without a W, R-I-G-G-L-E. Then we've got a young adult novel about hoarding which is another really good read called Dirty Little Secrets and it's by CJ Omalulu. And this book, a little bit on the same lines as the book Keepsake that I was just talking about, is about Lucy, who also has a secret, which is her mum's out of control hoarding, which has turned their lives into a world of garbage and shame. She's managed to keep her home life hidden from her best friend and her crush, knowing that they'd be disgusted by the truth. So when her mum dies suddenly in their home, Lucy hesitates to call 911 because revealing their way of life would make her future unbearable. And then she begins her two-day plan to set her life right. So this is a young adult novel which has details as fascinating as they are disturbing. And Omalulu waves an hour-by-hour hour account of Lucy's desperate attempt at normalcy. Her fear and isolation are palpable as readers are pulled down a path from which there's no return and the impact of hoarding on one teen's life will have readers completely hooked. So that's a great young adult novel about hoarding. Um, I'd just like to mention a couple of children's books which deal with hoarding as well. There's a book called More by I.C. Springman, which has a picture of a magpie on the cover, again playing to the idea of that myth that magpies are hoarders. Um, apparently they do actually hoard meat. That was revealed by Charlie Gilmore when talking about um, the magpie in his book Featherhood, um, uh, because the magpie very frequently put meat in his hair um, in order to store it there, to come back and get it later, or it would put meat under his bed or in little stashes round the room and round the house. So magpies are hoarders in a way, but not in the way that we've been led to believe by myths. Um, anyway, More by I.C. Springman is a children's book with a magpie on the cover, which is about one magpie, lots of stuff and a few friendly mice. And the purpose of the uh, of the book is to show us that less is more. And it asks the question, when is more more than enough? So that's a really interesting kids book about it. Um, my friend Evie also mentioned that there is a rat hoarder in the book Charlotte's Web and that rat hoarder is called Templeton, which I had forgotten about, I must admit, because it's been a long time since I read Charlotte's Web. But Charlotte's Web is an amazing, brilliant, beautiful book 
which I would recommend anyone to read if you haven't. And the rat in that book is a generally rather unlikable character and he very much is a hoarder. So that's a couple of children's books to mention. And I also would like to just return to the book um, by Lisa Jewell, which is called The House We Grew Up In, which is a really interesting book about a hoarder. So the main character, who's called Lorelei, is a lady and a mother who has had a lot of trauma in her own past. And she grows up being all bright and shiny and happy all the time because she's trying to make up for the rather sad and miserable childhood that she had herself. So when she has her four children, she puts on a brave and bright face all the time and she's always telling them what a wonderful life they have and always seems to be very happy. But she manifests her happiness by constantly keeping memories and souvenirs of that happiness. And those memories and souvenirs might be uh, pictures that the children uh, have drawn that she puts up on the wall, or wrappers from their Easter eggs, or um, shiny bright straws. So she keeps all those memories, but then she also loves going to the shop. She discovers Pound Stretcher in 1970s UK and she goes and buys 30 sponge scourers because they're incredibly cheap. And or she buys 20 pairs of rubber gloves because you never know when you're going to re need your rubber gloves. She has a hundred china plates stacked up on her shelves, even though she's never going to have a hundred people there together in her house at one time. So she is a classic, epic and rather horrifying kind of hoarder who, I must admit, I find completely terrifying because, as I mentioned earlier, I think I do slightly have hoarding tendencies myself. Look at all those books. And that's just the children's books. Um, so I do worry about hoarding. And I must say, reading Lisa Jewell's book is a great book to read, to put you off hoarding and to make you want to get out your cleaning materials, give everything a good spray, grab your grab all your cleaners, get hold of your rubber gloves and your duster and um, do as much cleaning as you possibly can and get rid of everything, go into all the dust around your house, get rid of all those cobwebs and lose any clutter that you have. Um, I do know some decluttering experts out there. I wonder if you're watching tonight. I might need to get you round to my house soon to declutter. So hoarding, it's a very bizarre and strange disorder. And I wonder if any of you have favourite hoarders in literature. Do, when you read about hoarders, what effect does it have on you? I do find it fascinating. And I think maybe that's partly because I could imagine if I didn't keep a grip on it, I would be quite a hoarder myself. Um, it's a tendency that is quite easy to give into. But maybe you are all fantastically decluttered and brilliant clean freaks. Laughing, John. I know that you're a clean freak. Um, and I'm sure that you have a very decluttered house with absolutely no teetering piles of newspapers. But if any of you are out there who might have hoarding tendencies, I would very much recommend reading all these books that I've just been mentioning, particularly uh, The Trauma Cleaner, because it's such a brilliant book and very inspiring, very interesting, and it does make you want to keep your house immaculate. And also The Lisa Jewell, The House We Grew Up In. I think they're the ones that are most effective 
in making you want to clean out your house. Laughing John is mentioning my parents live in a house of crap. Maybe that's why you're so clean and tidy yourself. It does seem to be a common thread. And actually, that does come up in the Lisa Jewell book that um, the mum who has the hoarding disorder, Lorelei, one of her kids is a total clean freak who is actually rather the opposite extreme of a hoarder and is a bit too minimal, some would say. So maybe that's a topic I need to do quite soon, is being ultra minimal, minimalism in literature, or being so minimal that you're completely bare in literature. Selma, great to see you this evening. You are not a hoarder. I wonder if you're someone who has ever had a tendency to hoard. I don't see you in that way. But I know, I feel like everyone can be a hoarder. And everyone could go in the direction of hoarder. I think you have to have great self-control to throw things out. And also, lots of us have been brought up to uh, waste not, want not, and therefore throwing things away seems like a bad idea. And um, I did have an example of something that I wanted to show you just to mention the fact that sometimes keeping things is a good idea. Um, Laughing John is mentioning my mum's yearly clear out is a shopping bag of rubbish from it. Ooh, that doesn't sound like enough of a clear out. So um, think, talking of my grandparents' attic, which is a place where they in a way hoarded things so you could say that they collected things because they had an amazing life living in many countries going all around the world and in that attic there were many many suitcases full of fascinating items and one of the things that I rescued from that attic which you could say was a kind of hoarder's paradise was this beautiful box which I'm just going to show you the contents of which I'm very glad that they kept because it is a beautiful thing. The sound might suddenly not be so good though. So in this box, it's a lovely box of cards, a kind of Indian pack of cards, which is rather fabulous. And that's an example of hoarding, you might say, or you might just say that it's an example of collecting things and keeping beautiful objects. Um, but on that merry note, I'm going to end this evening. I recommend to all of you reading The Trauma Cleaner and uh, all the other brilliant books that I've been mentioning tonight. I will post them on my Instagram page and on Facebook so that you can check out those books. And um, I'm now going to be thinking about books to help deal with cleaning disorder. I think that's quite an interesting topic that we should look at. So thanks so much for joining me this evening. Uh, it's been really interesting to go into the world of hoarders and I will post all those books up so you can see what they are and I'll see you next week. Good night. Thanks for coming. <laughs>